What are the first things an actor has to do once they get to L.A.? I realize that you're going to be rejected a lot and that it will take longer than you ever thought. Um, I came with a two-year plan and I thought that was uh, giving myself a lot of extra time, but I've been here four full years. This is going into my fifth year and um, only in the last year did I start to have any type of decent success and by that I mean that I could keep food on the table regularly. But I, but I came, I, I think that if you come you have to decide am I going to cut all ties with other careers and do this or not and, and I chose to not have a day job and um, it's made it more difficult but I couldn't have reached any success without it. When you came here four years ago how many IMDB credits did you have? Two. And how many do you have now? Uh, 100. I just passed my 100th IMBD credit and still nobody knows who the hell I am so you can make a lot of movies without actually bursting into the, the big public consciousness. Uh, I think that's another thing actors need to understand. You know, so I've done a couple of TV movies for uh, Hallmark Channel and they're great and I'm glad to be in them and they're, yes, they help. But they do not change your life and they don't change your career. There's so much noise that an actor has to burst through that you have to understand even if you get a big project, it may be a bump, but it's probably going to be a slight bump. It's more the accumulation of IMBD credits that make a difference. What about getting acclimated to L.A.? You came from somewhere else. I did. And how does one get acclimated to L.A. and also acclimated to actors hours, whatever that is? Well, I came from the East Coast. I'd done theater in New York and up and down the East Coast for 14 years. And I came out here expecting it to be much the same, um, and it's not. L.A. is not really a city. That's one thing you have to understand if you come here. It's a collection of smaller cities. Geography is very difficult. And um, your friendships, um, your ability to do auditions and work is all determined by traffic. <laughs> and, and that's a huge thing to realize when you come here. Um, if you're going to come to L.A. and try to be an actor, you have to be completely available emotionally, spiritually, physically. Um, your relationships, whatever they are, have to understand that this is your priority. Michael Caine said, and I think he's right, he said, this cannot be, if you want to make it, this cannot be just a full-time job. It has to be a full-time obsession. Um, and I find that to be very true. You have to be completely obsessed to the point that people who are not in the business will say, you're crazy. If they don't say that, you're probably not obsessed enough to make it in the business. What about looking for that side job while you're looking for those acting roles that are going to put food on the table? Where would you look for these side jobs and what type of hours would you look for in terms of those jobs? If you think you have to have a side job uh, when you first come to LA, try to get one that's very, very flexible. A lot of people are bartenders, um, caterers, anything that's uh, part-time. Um, don't get something that's going to lock you into particular hours every week because invariably you'll miss an audition and that's not going to do anything. You might not have gotten the audition, but it kills your morale. So I came here with a no day job plan and uh, it's been tough. You know, there's been a lot of peanut butter years. It's good that I'm thin. If you, that's another thing. If you're going to come to LA, you should probably decide that you're not going to eat as much as you thought you might eat or you're accustomed to eating in the first few years, you'll have times when you eat nothing but noodles and peanut butter. That's just the nature of the business. Other times you'll have steak. Uh, but yeah, your day job should be flexible. And what do you wish someone had told you before you got to LA? Or I, were you glad no one did say anything? I wish that before I came that someone had said, don't come because this is very, very difficult. It's a cruel town and a cruel business. No one cares and you have to do it yourself. Now I still would have come but I would have come with more awareness of just how difficult this business is. All that people ever see about Hollywood is the gloss and um, the entertainment and the glamour. That's all produced for the general public, not for actors. I wish that someone would produce content for actors saying, do not move to Los Angeles. It is very, very difficult. And then, the only people who will do it are those who will say, by damn, I'm going to do it. I can take it. Because that's the kind of spirit you have to have. You have to be tenacious and you can never, ever give up or you will not make it. I think one thing that's interesting is when people don't have somewhere to go back to, they tend to stick it out. Yes. What would you tell someone on how to emotionally survive coming here? 
because it is, it's very cold, and I think people need an outlet, whether it's reading, whether it's hiking, their church, whatever it is. I hike in Griffith Park. Uh, I come to this place every Sunday morning and spend time here, and this is my solace. I think you have to have something outside of yourself, uh, be it a relationship with God, a higher power, um, your relationships with your family. Um, you have to have other outlets other than acting because that's what allows you to, you know, to put your passion into your acting. At the same time, I know people who never think about acting except when they have an audition, and I think that's a big mistake. Um, you're a small business person, and you have to think of yourself as a small business person. So when I get up in the morning, I'm going to work. When I put my feet on the floor, I'm at work because I am my business. So there's not a moment that goes by, even if I'm hiking, even if I'm reading, I'm always looking for things that I can apply to my business. I think that's the only way you make it. We're entrepreneurs. And that's another thing that people don't say to actors. They say, come here and explore your inner self and, and, and feel the character. Well, yeah, that's great. But first, you have to get on set. And you don't do that unless you're a good business person. I don't mean to sound so earnest. This is what LA has done to me. This is what LA will do to an actor. If you achieve any type of success here, you become a bit more serious and then people say, boy, oh, you're kind of a hard ass, but it's a tough town. You made a living as an actor outside of LA for a good 12 years, correct? So for the last several years now, you've made a living from acting in LA. What's your opinion on where an unestablished actor should live if he or she wants to make a living as an actor. If you want to make a living as an actor, live centrally. Um, Hollywood is great because it's easy to get to everywhere. Um, Studio City also okay, but look at the map and try to put right in the center and don't be as concerned with going to the beach or where the clubs are. I mean, maybe this is easier for me to say because I'm in the middle age, but I'm not here to play, I'm here to work. So where I chose to live was determined by talking to people in the business and asking them where am I most likely to have to drive to and I want to be right in the center of that. For God's sake, don't get far out on the freeway um, and think I'm going to drive into LA for every audition and shoot because you're not. You're going to get a call back that says, hey, can you be here in two hours and you look at traffic and you're like, no, I can't. So you have to plan for that. So it's a full-time job. Every single day it's a full-time job. Speaking of clubs and having fun, I know that networking is a great part of the business and a lot of it's who you know, but what about people that want to be part of the group and they're always hanging out and they want to talk about films, but maybe nothing gets done and they don't want to rock the group dynamics. Do you think you have to almost be a lone wolf in some sense? I do think you have to be a lone wolf because you're moving within several groups of people. I have small independent producers. Now I have some larger producers that I deal with. I have directors that I work for for 50 bucks when I first came here. I have larger directors now who are doing million dollar films. And, and all of these circles rarely intersect and you have to be able to, to go and speak to each one of them as needed. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a good idea to hang with a certain group all the time. Um, you do have to be social, you do have to be able to, to network, but uh, I do believe that being a lone wolf is an advantage to an actor because you are like a wolf, right? I mean, you're always, you're always on the prowl, you're always on the hunt, you're always looking for the relationship that will help you. And I know that sounds cynical, but that's the business and that's any business. You spend your time on the relationships that are likely to benefit you and that person. It's symbiotic. Well, you see it. You go into a restaurant, everyone turns around to see who's walking in. Yes. And then they look, do I know that person? Can I go up to their table? Can I pitch them something? So I think everybody does it on any level. That's right. Whether they're starting out or whether they're an established studio person, I think you're always looking for that next thing. But no one can hook you up. And this is something people should tell actors who are coming to L.A. Because I've now just started to reach the level where I will have a younger actor occasionally say, hey, you know, could you hook me up with so-and-so? No. No. I can't. It took me four years to hook myself up, baby. You know, you hook yourself up. Was was the great old story of uh, Betty Davis, and I don't know where she was, but uh, some young actress asked her, you know, how would you advise me to get into studio films in Hollywood? And she said, take Fountain Avenue. It's quicker than Hollywood. And that's her advice. And she was saying, I got mine. You get yours. Yes, you'll help other people out, but no one can. I don't think even a really, really established actor can call a director and say, hey, I think you should put Bill on my film because I like him. People don't like that. They don't like being forced.
Right. Do you think a lot of people realize that? Because I've heard from people that I know that they thought friends or someone would help them get that extra leg up and they were disappointed once it didn't happen. Oh yes, I do think a lot of people, and I think it's a big lie, and people who come here need to know. I just spoke to someone yesterday, he was like, oh I got a buddy who's on a TV show, he's going to let me sleep on his couch, and he said he'd hook me up. I got that message on Facebook, and I wrote back, good luck man, I hope everything works out, but I'm thinking, he ain't gonna hook you up. You can't hook anybody up here. It's every person for themselves. It's a very mercenary bit. Do I sound cold? No, no, I think you sound like a realist. It, it, this I, is business. Yeah, this is not cool. play. This is not glamour. You put on the makeup, you put on the dress, you put on the suit, you go do the red carpet, but you do it because it's a part of business. The ordinary public, for whom this video is not intended, does not need to know any of this. It spoils their illusion just as much as if the camera tilted up on a set and suddenly you could see the ceiling. This is not for them. But if you're an actor and you're moving to LA, this is for you. This is a very, very difficult business. It's a bitch of a business and it'll eat you alive. And you talked about earlier coming to LA a little bit older. Sometimes people come out of college or maybe they skip college and they come here. And, and do you think maybe that was even more helpful that you came as a more mature person because you weren't swayed by hanging out with the group and wanting to be with the cool crowd having drinks on a Friday night? I was weird even when I was 20, um, so I probably would have been alone then. But yeah, uh, it's been good because, you know, I was a theater guy for 14 years and I did a lot of traveling on back roads and loading in, loading out and cleaning bathrooms and putting on Mark Twain wigs. and. Basements that only had cold water and scrubbing it off and you know you you learn doing that it gives you confidence I think by the time you reach middle age you do have confidence that that uh, it's going to be all right You know that you can do pretty much anything or try anything The bad side of coming in middle age of course is that it's a very youth-based culture And you have to find a niche which is why I've you know been lucky to have this face and be able to be the scary guy The disturbing guy the weird guy because otherwise I'd just be a middle-aged actor with bad skin and I'd, I'd have been back east in six months if I wasn't frightening. Bill, what would you say to an actor that's in the wonderful position of being offered paying roles, but then there's that catch, there's that sort of problem of prosperity where all those people that knew you as the great actor that could do things for free, for the love of it, now know that you're a working actor and there's a cost. This is probably the most difficult uh, transition that I've had to go through in the past year. You do work for free when you come here and because you just want to rack up IMBD credits, you work for very low pay, you take as many jobs as you can get, but if you stay here long enough and you're able to survive, you will reach a point where you have to surrender some of that control to your representation. And you have to trust your representation enough so that if they say you're not going to be in this project, you say no to the project. You become an offer actor. I have less auditions now. Um, it, 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 it doesn't mean that I don't have to try. It just means that now my roles come more through relationships than through cold auditions than they used to. Um, because people have somewhat of an awareness of who you are, but it's very difficult when someone comes to you who you've had a prior relationship with at a very, very low rate, and they come to you with a project, and you have to say, please speak to my representation. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we're friends and I love working with you, but talk to my representation. That's a big step, especially if you've come here as a do-it-yourselfer and you've worked very hard to get to that level. And then they speak to your representation and they may call you and say, Karen, I can't believe that I'm being talked to this way. I've heard that. And what they mean by, I can't believe I'm being talked to this way is, I can't believe that your representation is asking for a fair rate of pay. Um, and they'll say things like, well, it's coming out of pocket. Well, everything comes out of pocket. You know, nonprofit. This is business, <laughs> and this is what I do for a living. And at some point, and this is the hardest thing for an actor to do, because we're all needy, we're all needy, is to say, I have a, a, a skill, I have a certain set of skills that I can do on camera. I have something I can bring to your production, and I want to bring it to your production, but you have to pay me to do it, just as people have to pay you to do your job. You don't ask a plumber to work for free. And I know that actors have to work for free, but as soon as you can stop doing that, stop. 
because it's a bad habit and it's not going to bode well for your future and your representation won't like it. And when you reach a certain point, you depend on that representation. Well, what if someone says to you, oh, this is a passion project. We're all here out of the love of it and, and we're a nonprofit and everyone else is doing it for free. And if everyone else is doing it for free, then everyone else must be rich and I'm not. You know, I don't have stakes in the freezer. <laughs> um, this is a business. There is room for passion, but at some point the movie is going to be released. Let's say I want to hire you and it comes down to an additional hundred bucks. Silly example, but it comes down to a hundred. And you want that hundred bucks and I'm saying no. So I got to stop and think, is Karen going to bring an additional hundred bucks value to my project? That's 10 DVD sales. Is it likely that in the world, 10 human beings will buy my movie more because Karen's in it? If not, you don't need to be in it. But the answer is probably yes, if I approached you in the first place. So both sides on the negotiating table have to be smart. You can't insult the other person. But this is a business and actors do this for a living. It's my passion, but it's also my living. I'm a stock. And if a stock gets to a certain point, there's no shareholder that wants to say, well, let's lower the value. Because then you'll never get back to the value that you were. I know it sounds cold and hard and even passionless, but if the deal has worked and I actually get on set, I pour my passion into it. But my passion is not for working for free. That's not the way to build a career. Do you think people realize that when you approach someone for pay and then you try to kind of retract and say, hey, is there any way we could do sort of a barter type of a thing, that that sours it even more? Do you I think so, yeah. It's just a matter of respect. I've had actors say, offer me gas money. At least that. At least that. It's yeah. just showing respect to the actor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think so. And. And you look at the level that the actors at too, what projects have they worked on recently, do they actually bring value to their project? If they don't, fine, work for free or don't be in my movie. But if you have actually approached an actor and made an offer and then their representation comes back to you and says, that's not enough, what can you do? Don't be pissy about it, negotiate. It's like any other business. I'm buying a car, I'm not gonna pay the sticker price but you're not gonna let me walk off the lot for two grand either. We're gonna go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and I have noticed that what seems to be different in this business, at least on an independent film level, is some people don't wanna do the back and forth. They don't like the process of negotiation because they just want to make the passion project, and so do I. But you never get to that unless you can negotiate. Again, it's looking at it as a business. So friendships, let's say they then come back to you and say, I can't believe your representation spoke to me like that. And, which and people do. How do you handle that without hurting their feelings and losing the friendship? Do I owe them a favor or not? Because if I owe them a favor, then I'm going to call my representation and say, you know, I need to repay this favor. Can, can we work it out to do this project? But if I don't owe them a favor and they call me and say, your representation has hurt my feelings, then I'll say my representation is not me. And you're not hiring me, your friend, you're hiring Bill Obers Jr., who is a commodity that I've spent four years busting my ass to build up. And that's what that commodity, that's what the current market value of that commodity is. I'm still Billy, I'm still your friend. But it's hard to make that separation sometimes. Bill, we want to congratulate you. I understand that you just signed with AEF Talent Agency. And I think the last time we spoke to you was almost a year ago. So yes. a lot's been happening. I think you've had numerous things happen. Um, can you tell us how you signed with them and what lessons did you learn in the process that you can share with other actors? That's, that's a very good question. Um, I've been trying to get signed with a higher level uh, agency or an agent at all since I got here. My manager did this. I have a wonderful manager named Matt Chasen and he made these contacts, uh, but I had to ha accumulate enough of a body of work for the agency to be interested in me. Then it took a couple of months to set up the meeting. And then when we actually did go and meet, it was very, very different than agent meetings I had been in before because at that level, things are quite serious. Um, there's very little joviality and there shouldn't be because it's a big decision for both parties. Um, so, and it's been, 
it's been good and it's been different because now I'm represented by someone who has some standing in the industry so when people come for projects that's who they go to and um, my manager and my agent have become sort of a buffer which is hard in one way you know it's hard because it is about relationships um, but if you think of yourself as a product then you know there's always the middleman and those who are representing the product and putting it on the shelf and that's 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 the best way to think of it what can you tell some other actors about the process and what some of the steps you took and also too from maybe prior people that wanted to sign you and you pulled back say no uh, be willing to say no uh, because someone wants to sign you doesn't mean that you should sign with them um, because once you reach a level of doing 50 IMBD projects there are people who say sure I'll take you on um, but I've really depended on my manager to say let's wait let's wait let's wait until we can get with an agency that means something and that's hard to do it's really hard to wait because again actors are needy we just want to work we just want to work we just want to work and that's all that matters to us but from a business standpoint um, there's more and it's the power of saying no and it's it's the hardest thing in the world for an actor to say no how can we practice how do we practice saying no what if we're people pleasers and we don't we just don't want to hurt people I am a people pleaser I want everyone to like me to the point that I have Google Alerts set up and if someone on a blog or a review says something about me or a performance that is not favorable, I'll go there, I'll leave a comment and say you were absolutely right. I agree with you, I made bad mistakes there and um, you know I hope you'll give me another chance. In an effort to get that person, which they usually do, to then say, oh well you know, I'll, for sure I'm glad you, thanks for writing and I'll be looking for you in the future. Like, it's pathological with actors that we have to have, everybody has to like us and our relationship with everybody has to be okay. I don't know any actor who likes to have someone they think does not like them. I have one wardrobe person in the hundred projects I've done who doesn't like me. I hung the hanger the wrong way and it was early on and I didn't know the way to hang the hanger, but I was trying to be nice and instead I made extra work for her. And I'm still looking for a chance to work with her again to make her like me. Is that sick? So what's a soft no and what's a hard no? Because some people are really good at hard no's and they enjoy being the contrarian and they enjoy being the one in control. But how do you do a soft no? Oh, you better do soft no's in LA or you ain't gonna work. If all you can do is hard no's, forget it because you insult people. Um, a hard no is, Karen, you're crazy. Why would I work on your project? I will never ever work with you or anybody that you know again because I've said that and how many people will you tell that but a soft no is I really really love this project and I love the role and I want to do it and I wish that I were financially stable enough to be able to pick and choose my roles because if I did I'd be on your set today I'm just not able to do it right now and I feel really bad about it and I'm embarrassed to even mention it to you. But I hope you might find it in your heart to forgive me for not being able to work with you. That's an extreme soft wow. no. That was beautiful. But I mean it. I always mean it. You know, you never tell somebody no. You always say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm so sorry. I wish, I really wish I could and I want to. But I just can't right now. But in the future I really want to work with you because and this, this is another thing. Actors coming to LA need to realize people love to be stroked. They love to be stroked. Look up the IMBD. What have they done? Research them on the web. I really want to work with you in future, even though I'm saying now because I like what you did on ABCD. Then you've built a relationship within the no. That's the way to do it. I like that. Now your representation can give a hard no. And then you can say, oh my gosh, you know, you know, do I'm sorry my manager and my agent are such hard asses, but I really love you. Keep your personal relationship good. Is there anything in this business that's real? Hearing myself talk, I'm wondering. Is this entirely a business of illusion? Possibly. Yeah.
Yeah, but I, I think what you're saying is, is correct in terms of like the, the coldness and being able to, to even on that red carpet, because that, that little part is just such a minuscule part and that's what everybody sees. Yeah. And, and they don't see where you walk into rooms and you feel the vibe and it's not as friendly or it's not, you know, and it's not to be negative. You know, we're trying to be more positive with our Film Courage interviews, but I, I think people from other parts don't realize that it, it is tough. And, and I think it's good that you're giving a, a healthy dose of reality and you're not sugarcoating coating it and, you know, you know follow the, your dreams and money will fall, you know, that, that kind of thing. I'm I think the only reason to do this is because you feel that you were born to do it. And so that's why you put up with all the crap. And that's why you think through all the business strategy and that's why you do it all is because it feeds something inside of you to pretend to be other people or to create stories where other people pretend to be other people. I have no idea where that comes from, but I think it's an inborn vocation. That's the only kind of person that should be an actor. And then your satisfaction is actually getting to do what you love for a living if you do all this other stuff. So I answer my own question by saying that's what's real. The passion that's within us, that's what's real. And you have to keep that burning and keep it alive even as you go through all of the business. And if you're able to sit in a cubicle five days a week and then just go to movies and live all that out on the weekends, then it's great, but don't come to Hollywood. Bill, I believe your idea about acting is not just talent and creativity and imagination, but it's also this business side, this very left brain type of thinking about marketing and spending time on the computer and, and selling yourself and being your brand. As you've moved up the ranks, as you've been here four years and booked more roles and become more noticeable, do you see that other people in that stratosphere also think the same? And the ones that maybe you might have climbed past didn't think that way? Well, I don't think, I, I don't think I've climbed past anybody. They're probably right on my butt right now and I just don't know it. <laughs> but, um, but the answer is yes. Um, the, the, uh, when you deal with actors who have been here longer than I have and have been more successful than I have, they're very, very business minded and very marketing minded and very strategic minded. Uh, I don't think they would have lasted, especially not at my age. You know, when I, when I look at actors who are my age and who most of them have either quit or they've made it really big. And so the people that I know who are in my age range who've made it really big have done it by being absolutely strategic when it comes to marketing. I think it's important. I've done some marketing seminars where I've spoken to actors and said, this is what you need to do. And then I've had some of them afterwards uh, contact me and say, well, can I pay you to do it? Well, no, I mean, I, it, it's a full-time job and you have to do it from your passion. Nobody can do this for you. Um, but it's the thing, actors don't like to do paperwork and you know, generally we don't like that side of things, but it's essential. If you were to break down your day or your week, how much time of your waking hours are spent on the business side, the being at the computer, and how much is spent on the creative, oh, thinking of a great character, back study and, and, <laughs> and rehearsing lines, and hey, can we meet to go over this scene? 12 hours in one hour. <laughs> the one hour is a stretch. Um, I've got to shoot tomorrow, so when I get done with you guys, I'm going to walk around Hollywood and look at my lines and feel them and struggle with them and think, oh my God, I can't do this. And then I'll walk up to Griffith Park and I'll pray and I'll think I can't do this and then I'll decide that I can do it and then it's done. I'm ready to go to set. But I spent the entire week before talking to you guys marketing and submitting and stroking relationships and looking for projects and reading scripts. So yeah, a lot of it's business. Reading scripts is hard. When people start sending you scripts, you get five scripts in a week. It's wonderful to be sent scripts, but it takes two hours to read each one if you're actually gonna read it and not cheat and just say, oh, my role is Bob. I'm just gonna look for all the instances of Bob in the script. Uh, so yes, the marketing, the business, that's 99.9% .9 of the time. You mentioned walking around Hollywood reciting your lines. We yes. just saw a young man the other day and we were so fascinated by this guy who was in his own world rehearsing. Is that something that you do? <laughs> Is that, I, I found it fascinating to watch this. Yeah, because people think you're crazy and it helps the sense of isolation that you have to have as an actor. 
Um, you have to be completely in your character. And I do this, you know, I walk to the gym, I walk back and forth with my lines, my little sides in my hands, I'm talking to myself out loud and people stare and pull their children away and, <laughs> you know, it's okay. That's, that's what an actor does. I find that the best way for me to, to learn lines and to, to get the meaning of the lines is to move while I'm doing it. I can't do it while I'm sitting down. So it's good to walk and be in motion and try to figure out these lines. And the words will tell you how they want to be said if you walk with them enough. Like you might think you have a line reading, but just keep working it, keep working it, keep walking, keep moving, keep moving. And the words will tell you, no, this is how I want to be said. And, and then you'll have your reading that you can take to set and have something else in your pocket if the actor wants something different. And to reiterate what you said, that's like a one hour possibly portion of your day or and the other's 12? Oh yeah, if that, you yeah, know, if that, because it, it doesn't, to sit around thinking about how I might play a character that I haven't booked, it's of no benefit. I need to be spending this time booking the character. Then I can start working on the character. It's not a good business for dreamers. I guess unless you're extremely young, extremely beautiful, and you have kind of a backup of uh, money then you could sit around and dream, but I can't. I don't have time to dream. I don't have time to sit around with other actors and have coffee. And I don't have time for any of that. This is so hard. I don't mean to sound petty in that way, but you have to be completely focused on what you're doing. What about to do a lot of scene study in films? Sit around all day and watch movies that you love? and talk about how Nicholson played it like this and it was amazing and look how he got angry right here and what about that? I cannot bring myself when I'm in my apartment to ever watch a movie because I always think there's something else I could be doing. What else could I be doing to further my career instead of looking at Jack Nicholson's career? <laughs> but I will go to movies a couple times a week. The Egyptian runs a lot of older films and I've really enjoyed that. I've enjoyed studying these older actors who are in my sort of type, like Lee Marvin, and watching Edward G. Robinson, and watching how these old guys worked the camera. Even though the acting styles are different, there's a lot to be learned. So I'll go to school there, you know, about once a week, but sitting around watching movies in the apartment, I can't do it because I'm always looking at the computer and thinking, is there one more thing I could do before I go to bed tonight? Is there one more thing I could do that might advance my career. I am, God, I'm obsessed. Listening to myself talk, I want to quit this business. I'm too obsessed. But I don't know how to do anything else for a living. This is all I know how to do and all I want to do. It's kind of sad, isn't it? No, I think it's great. <laughs> Bill, it's day one of a new shoot and it's an hour before you have to be on set. What are you doing? <laughs> Rejoicing because in a business with a 98% unemployment rate, I'm about to work. And this is the happiest time because then you can leave behind all the marketing, all the business, all of the other stuff we've discussed because none of it really matters once you're on set. Then you're an artist. Then your passion can, can flare. Um, I go off the grid for shoots now. I started doing this after a movie called Children of Sorrow. It was the first time I went off the grid and the results were good. And now cell phone off, computer off. I don't talk. If, I'm on set. I'm on set. I'm on set. I'm on set. That's it. That's the only answer I can give to any question. The world just expl I'm on set, man. I'm sorry. I'll deal with it in a minute. All right? And, unless it's, you know, your, your kid's in trouble or something like that. If it, unless it's an extreme emergency away from the world and that hour before you actually have to leave the house to go there and leave early, <laughs> do something that you love. Do something you really, really love. What is it that you love doing more than anything in the world? I like doing push-ups. I love it. I really love the feel of it. And then I love the <laughs> and then trying to do some more. So I might spend the hour listening to music I really like or doing push-ups, you know? Um, do something you really, really like because when you get on set, you don't want to be technical-minded or business-minded. You want to be in touch with your passion and the reason that you go to all this trouble to do it. Let's take it a step further. How about um, a few days before you're supposed to be on set? Are there any things you're doing differently? Yes. Um, a few days before you be on set, every single day work your lines. 
I'm a big believer, and um, I got this from Michael Caine. It was the best five bucks I ever spent was Michael Caine's book, Acting on Film. Uh, people should buy it. He said, uh, work your lines so completely that anyone could throw you a cue at any point in the day, and you hit them back with the cue. So that there's absolutely no thought. And I do this by writing them out in longhand and then seeing if I can write them backwards. And so every morning for a few days before, I'll go through this exercise of writing out the lines and then seeing if I can write them backwards. And then you truly do know in frontwards and backwards. Uh, and then all throughout the day, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And you, a little bits of business start to come to you that would not if you didn't have those extra days to do it. Don't wait till the day of. Because by that time, you should already you know, have some choices prepared. And if the director wants something different, you have maybe something else in your pocket. Which film set was your greatest teacher? There were two. There were two. Both were good and both really stretched me. One was a film called The Retrieval, which is played at South by Southwest. It's a Civil War era drama. I play a bounty hunter in the 1860s and I'm after escaped slaves. The director wanted me to be still in the frame. And as you can see by all this, it's hard for me to be still, but there's a great power to being still in the frame. And he wanted me to be still. And he wanted me to drop my vocal range. And he wanted almost no inflection as I spoke to you. That's what he wanted. That's what I had to learn to do. And it was really devilishly hard. But the results are quite good. And the reviews have been good. And I learned that. Children of Sorrow was a, a horror film in which I play a cult leader in the desert by a director named Jordan McClure who wanted me to improv. I hate improv. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I'm old school. I need lines, <laughs> which I guess means I'm not a very good actor. Uh, but Jordan forced me to improv, and I hated it, but it took me to school. And by the end of the shoot, I was completely into the character, and it made me comfortable with it. So both of those were very, very difficult things for me to learn to do, to do some improv and to be still in the frame. But both of them, the results were very good and the reviews for both of them have been better than anything else I've ever done. Since we met with you last year, you had a chance to work with Jim Carrey. Did you ever think this would happen? Uh, no. Uh, the, one of the producers at Funny or Die had directed a film that I was in and I uh, got a call asking if I would come and do it in the morning and I did and there's Jim Carrey walking around sticking out his hand like he's an unknown actor saying, hi, I'm Jim. And inwardly you're thinking, I know. <laughs> but it was really very, very nice and this is something that I find with um, higher level actors, <clears throat> most of them are very kind. And they will present themselves that way, you know, Tom Cruise, or hi, I'm Tom, giving you the opportunity to say, hi, I'm Karen, so that you meet on an equal level. Um, I, th I think it's wonderful. So when you got the call about this short film that you were doing, this comedy thing with the hee-haw, were you aware that Jim Carrey was part of it, or you, you didn't know until you got on set? I, I was, but the, um, I did it as a favor for the... Uh, producer who called me because it's not my usual cup of tea. You know, I'm not a comedian. I don't do comedy, and um, and and it, it's not what it's something that I usually do or something I would have done had not you know a favor been called in. And I'm glad I did it. It was a great experience. It was it was an anomaly for me. But that's this town. If you owe someone a favor, <clears throat> and they store up that favor, and uh, because they had used me for some shoots before and, and I did owe the favor and if someone calls in that favor and says hey Karen Spill you know I'm gonna have to do whatever this is unless it's you know killing a child or something <laughs> because the worst thing in this business is to be known as yeah I did her a favor and I asked her for one and she wouldn't do it word gets around so yeah repay your favors since you shot the film and it's aired on Funny or Die and I think it's it's all over other YouTube and things like that. Have you noticed an impact? Uh, yes, my mom called and said, I saw you on Fox News. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so um, it, it, I don't usually get involved in anything that makes any sort of political statement. Uh, so my hometown newspaper, of course, you know, they want to do an interview. So I, you know, I said it was an acting job and it was fun to do and I'm glad to have had it, but it doesn't you know, necessarily represent any of my own personal political views. I think it's had something like um, three, four million hits, something like that. Take this lollipop has had over 110 million hits so far. 
and counting. So more people have seen me stalking them on Facebook than have seen me being the host of Hee Haw. How did that feel to have sort of the local boy makes good um, aspect? Of uh, very weird, very weird, because you know how it is when people in your hometown I'd be like, I knew Karen, I knew her and she was growing up. Who does she think she is? You're always very aware of that. So you always want to downplay everything. So, hey, local paper calling, you just won an Oscar. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, I needed a doorstop. And so I'll just, you know, put it there. So it's not a big deal. You never want to be the one that says, oh, yes. I knew I would do it. I hate that. <laughs> I hate it. Always knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. What's more important for an actor, Bill, their resume or their IMDb page? IMDb is your resume. Okay. It's, it's everything. Um, IMDb is where people go to see whether you've been working, who you've worked with. If you don't have a lot of credits on your IMDb page, and some of them are not in red, showing that they're in pre-production or filming or just in post, then you're not considered to be working. It doesn't matter what your resume says because people don't have time anymore to do anything other than give you a 20 second Google. And the first thing that's gonna come up is your IMBD. So I'm a big believer in pimping out your IMBD page. Put your tweets on there, put your blog post on there, try to get comments on there. You want it to look full and rich because I, mean, I may be wrong, but I think that's an actor's web page today. That is our website. What about your bio? How long do you make it? There's some people that, I mean, they have a dissertation written, and then there's others that's just a quick thing. What do you think is the best approach to writing your bio on IMDb? Here's my little IMDb bio trick. When you Google yourself, <clears throat> look in the first sentence and a half, roughly, of your IMDb bio show in the extract on the Google page. So that first sentence and a half is crucial because many times people won't even click to the IMDb. They're just seeing who you are. And that bio should tell exactly who you are. Don't waste that first sentence and a half with, he was born in Kansas and he likes puppies. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. So when I started out, <clears throat> my bio said, Bill Obers Jr. is an American actor known for disturbing on-screen presence. I wasn't. I am now. But I wasn't. But I said I was. And it became true. It's very, very important. Now I've switched it to Bill Obers Jr. is the face of the Emmy award-winning Application from Jason Zada, take this lollipop, and then the rest. So that way, even if they never go deeper into the bio, they get that extract on the Google page. So if someone doesn't have the experience they would like, should they write something that's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yes, self-fulfilling prophecy. You are so right. That's very, very smart of you to say that. Perception is reality. My manager, Matt Chasen, says this to me all the time. Perception is reality in this business. And it's not a joke. It's true. What you want to be known for, say that you already are known for it. And it helps people categorize you. Because it's really important in L.A. to have casting directors know what you're known for. And it helps them do their job. What if you don't know your category? What if you don't know how to identify yourself? What, what if you're still in a work in progress? If Did you don't you? know how to identify yourself, then you don't know your brand. And if you don't know your brand, you won't work. Create a brand. The best way to do it, if you don't know how to do it yourself, you can pay people thousands and thousands of dollars to do this, or you can work. If you're just starting out, take the jobs, whether they pay or not, and talk to the DP and the director. They're the ones looking at the lens. Sometime you'll do a thing on camera and you'll hear a DP say, wow, that's really good. What was that thing? What did I do? Something with my eyes, something with my face? What was it? What was it? Question them. What is it? Not what makes me look good in the frame, because that's just vanity. What does the camera love to see me do? How can I make love to the camera? How can I kiss the camera? You find that thing. Everybody has that thing. If you're not looking for it, then you're either not working, not talking to the DPs, or you're just lazy. My experience is nobody cares if you're versatile because everybody's versatile. If you can do everything, you can do nothing. Pick those few things that you can do extremely well on camera to the exclusion of everyone else and promote the hell out of them. So don't say you're a chameleon? No, I don't think a chameleon works. Again, perhaps if you're very young and very beautiful, a lot of this goes out of the window, but I am neither. I can't be a chameleon. The casting directors have to say, I want that guy that has the fill in the blank. Get me that guy. They don't have time for much else. They're very, very busy and you have to help them. You have to be the solution to their problem. You've booked 100 roles. 
in the last five years. If someone were to come to you and ask you how you did it, what would you tell them? What's the Reader's Digest version of how you did it? Never turn down a role when you're starting because you can't afford to. Work, 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 work. Audition, make cold calls, build relationships, network, promote your work. And I think probably the most important important part of that equation is promoting your work. When you've done something, no matter how small, trumpet it. Because people in the industry want to know that you're working. You are not desirable if you're not working. And if you're working and they don't know you're working, it's the same as not working. So don't be afraid to say, I just did a fantastic short and I had a supporting role. Now, you don't have to say I'm fantastic. I was great in this short. Instead, you say, I'm really happy to have worked with fill in the blank on what I think was a very artistic endeavor. The DP, blah, blah, did a fantastic job. I'm glad to have played a small part in the process. Even if you were the lead, say that. Then those people are then going to repost you and further help promote. But I think you have to promote your work and that's how you get more work because people say, oh, well, Karen's working. I want her because other people want her, just like dating. Take us to one of your cold calls, the moment the phone picks up, hello. Uh, usually it's a producer uh, because nobody deals with producers. And I had a producer early on tell me, you know, nobody gives us the respect. We're part of the team too. And I thought, aha, opportunity. So usually I've written to the producer and asked, could I give you a call? This happened after Take This Lollipop. I contacted uh, producers of German content for German television because Take This Lollipop ran on Der Spiegel TV. And I had a bite. And so we set up a phone conference and it was by Skype. And you know, they're in Berlin and I'm here. And um, they say, hello, how are you? And I said, you know, I'm fine, how are you? Did you get a chance to take a look at the lollipop? Go ahead and, and immediately begin. Don't waste their time, immediately begin. And they'll say, yes, we did. Well, that ended up turning into a little production deal from that company, from a cold call. So, it, but for every one of those that works, you know, you go through 79 that don't. In terms of the cold call etiquette, how do you approach it? Are you long-winded and friendly and jovial in your approach or no. are you very business-minded? You have to be who you are as a person and, and that'll come through your naturalness and I'm not long-winded, I'm not jovial and at parties I just stand in the corner and want to talk about serious subjects and <laughs> so that's not who I am. So if I'm calling you I'll be like, um, Karen, how are you? And once you say fine, I'm done with the joviality. I'm ready to move <laughs> on to the business. I think you have to be yourself. So you say hi, how are you? And I say fine. Uh, your... I'll say, great, I wanted to talk to you about blah, blah, blah. The same with an email. Um, Hi, Karen, hope you've been well. I'm writing because blah, blah. I want that second sentence to tell you why is this? Because a lot of times I'll get an email or even a phone call and I don't know what they want. All I need to know in the course of my day is what do you want from me? And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean let's begin the dialogue. What is it that you want? And if you're not asking for the sale and making the request and telling me what you want, I can't tell you if I can help you or not. And I go through three paragraphs of the email and I just get discouraged and I'll just save it and archive it and say, I'm going to look at this later. And then a month later, they'll call and say, did you ever look at so-and-so? And what I want to say is, just tell me what you want. So yeah, be, being direct really helps with this business. Of course, that was a long-winded answer. It wasn't very direct. <laughs> The Retrieval. Now that's a film that played at South by Southwest this year, correct? And you had a leading role in it. What do you love about the film and how beneficial was it for you to attend the festival? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you that this is an example of taking every job because this is a job I did three years ago. And uh, it was an audition that I didn't want to go to. I specifically remember the day because I thought the part wasn't right for me. And I made myself get up and go. I was really discouraged and depressed that day about not working, but I went. We did the film and I never heard anything for almost three years and I figured, well, you know, that was a waste. <laughs> um, and it turned out that the film was finished and it ended up in South by Southwest. So there I am in Austin attending the premiere of my first film that's run at South by Southwest. 
and it won an award at South by Southwest and has went on to win awards for director and for cast at Ashland Independent in Oregon and at the Phoenix Film Festival and running as a part of the SAG Foundation's conversation series for SAG members to come and watch it. So um, it's turned out to be very prestigious and a, a nice high-level project for me, but it turned started out as an audition that I didn't really want to go to. What factored into your decision in terms of going to South by Southwest? How was that important to your brand? I called my manager and I said, um, you know, there's a film that I'm a co-lead in that's running in South by Southwest, and he said, you're going. And I said, well, you know, I don't really know if I can work my schedule, if I can afford it, this and that. And he said, you're going. You don't miss an opportunity like this. You're going to South by Southwest. So I went, and I'm really, really glad I went. Um, it's just, again, it's the perception that people have. Uh, they see you at South by Southwest. They see photos of you there. It, it's important. It enhances your status in the industry. In general, would you advise other filmmakers or actors to make sure to attend their festival? Yeah, if you're in a festival and you don't go, you're missing an opportunity. If Put it on a credit card and go. Um, beg a room to stay with a friend, put an ad on Craigslist, do whatever you have to go to be there to be associated with your film. It's a golden opportunity, these film festivals are. Um, you know, you, work, you work, work so, so hard on a film and you've got it in front of an audience and there's press there. For you not to be there is, it's, it's a real big opportunity missed. If you can go, in any way go. And once you go, what are you bringing with you, aside a great suit maybe, or your cards, what are you doing so that you're not that guy that's, you know, totally promoting themselves, but at the same time, you're available, you're approachable. You're asking other people about their work, everybody that you meet. Everybody has work they're doing that they want to promote. Everybody has something they want to tell you. Don't talk about yourself. Talk about them. Hi, I'm Bill Oberst, Jr. That's all you have to say to somebody in the industry. Hi, I'm Bob Jones. They will tell you then everything they want. You listen, you nod, you ask intelligent follow-up questions, and they will say, wow, he's one of the best conversationalists I've ever... And that's because you talked about them and you listened to them. Everybody wants to be listened to. So never start sentences with I. In other words, if you're at the film festival, they don't need to know what else you've been, well, yes, I just did this web series and I'm working on blah, 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 and I went to producer's callback. You're already at the film festival. You're in the freaking movie that's running at the film festival. Now let it be about them. And that makes you appear even bigger. Because if you're with a big star, I don't think that you're ever going to hear them say, you know, oh, I just finished this movie with Scorsese. They don't need to say that. And so that's the kind of aura that you want to put off, is that you're about other people. Telling all my tricks here. What would you tell a younger actor seeking an agent? Before you approach an agent about representing you, um, put yourself in the agent's shoes and have empathy for them and understand that if they say no, it's nothing personal. This will also help you understand what the agent may be looking for the only reason that an agent's going to be interested in you is if they think they can make money off of you. Understand that. It's not about whether they like you or not. It's whether you, as a commodity, can make them money if it's a good fit. And um, they'll be very interested in you if they think they can make money off of you. So when you make your approach to them, why are you marketable? You know, what about you makes you special or different from any other actor in your category? Know those things and don't be afraid to say them and, and to ask for the sale. To, to end the conversation by saying, reiterating those points by saying, you know, Karen, I would really like to be associated with your agency because ABC, which are the same things you said at the beginning. It's a business sales call. So this hypothetical young actor is going to meet for an agent the first time. Yes. What are they doing the day leading up, two days leading up, and then once they get to the office? Treat it like an audition, um, which means you are going to be early. You're going to be well prepared. You are already going to have had the conversation in your head so many times that you're absolutely comfortable. You're never flummoxed. You're going to wear something that you feel really comfortable in, and that morning, you're going to do something that you really love to do and have plenty of time 
to get there. That's so important in LA. Do not ever be rushed because it'll show in your face. And then when you get there, listen. When I had my agent meeting for the agent that I just signed with, the, she didn't ask me very many questions. Mostly, I listen. Because if you're sitting across the desk from an agent, they've already done their due diligence, they've done their homework. You don't have to impress them. They'll ask you what they want to know of you. What they really want to know is they want to look into your eyes and say, can I trust you and you trust me? Sounds like that's a really interesting tip and a very big part of what you do is getting your mindset in a great f place before you go somewhere. Understand that as an actor, you're an entertainer and your job is to entertain. Um, even if you're meeting with an agent, you want it to be a pleasant encounter for them. You want them to feel uplifted. You want their day to be brighter. Even when you're doing an audition, before you begin the audition, you're an entertainer. I don't mean you sing and dance. But one of the best tips I ever got was say your name when you come in the room. So I come in the audition room, and instead of standing there looking for my ex, I say, hey guys, I'm Bill Oberst Jr. That's it. It changes the atmosphere of the room. It makes everybody kind of brighten up or smile a little bit. You're always an entertainer if you're an actor, and your job is not to bitch or be concerned about yourself. Your job is to lift other people up. That's what an entertainer does. We lift people up and we make their days brighter. An entertainer is a servant. I think that's a good mentality to have. Wow, that's great. So you're not, what if you have to do your taxes and you know that you have to be there or just something that's just painful, will you schedule it for another time just so yes. you can spend 15 minutes listening to music, doing push-ups? Yes. And going to sort of that happy place? Because if you don't, you'll be filled with self-pity and self-pity is anathema to an actor. You'll never book if you, because they'll feel it, they'll smell it. You need to be confident and successful. If there's something unpleasant that you have to do, yeah, try not to do it the day that you have an audition or you have a meeting with an agent or any type of interaction. This morning when I got up, before you, I talked to you guys, I made myself turn the computer off for an hour before I came here and it was really hard because I thought of a lot of things I could do online. I said, no, I don't want to get there and I don't want to be in this busy, busy mindset. I really want to be able to relate as a human being and look in someone's eyes and talk. Because that's a part of our job too, as well as staring at that screen. Bill, do you view it as your job to promote the movies that you act in? Yes, and um, I give credit for this great quote to Carrie Nassana, who's an acting coach and an actress, and she told me that when she books a job, Carrie says, look, I'm a marketing partner for the life of your movie. That really adds value, because um, I think what it's about is, is an actor, yes, I, I, hopefully I can do the job that you hired me to do, but what can I do beyond that to add value to that? How can I not only meet your expectations, but exceed them? And I can do that by being your marketing partner for that movie forever and ever and ever. It's part of my job, too. Have you seen that trait from other actors? Some. Um, some, not so much. Some think that it's, you know, kind of grubbing to get down in the trenches and do the tweets and write about the movie and that they just want to come in and be the actor actress. And um, I, I can't speak for them, but for me, it doesn't work. I get much more play and I book more business when I'm a marketing partner for the movie because what's good for the movie is good for me. It's the way that I see it. Why do you think people don't want to do the promotional part? I don't, I don't think it's that they don't want to work. I think it's that they don't see it as a part of their job or they think that it enhances their status not to be involved in the promotion. Um, but at my level of acting, you know, I'm not an A-lister and I, I can't afford not to be a full partner because what if the film does something really well? You know, this film that just ran at South by Southwest. Yes, I am going to be your marketing partner. I'm there. And anytime they include me on any of their publicity, I write the director and I say, thank you for including me. I know you didn't have to do that. Here's what I'm doing. So don't take it as an expectation that the movie is going to build you up. Your job is to build the movie up. Your job doesn't end when you step off set. In some senses, you know, it, it only begins. I get 100 credits, and so I've got 100 marketing jobs. As long as those things are around, big or small, it's my job wherever I can to push them. Bill, you've been in L.A. for four years. 
How many of those years have you spent in acting class? Is being on set considered an acting class? If it's not, then none. I've never been to an acting class in LA. I just came here and started working, and I couldn't afford acting classes, so I figured, well, I'm just going to work, and I'll learn on set by falling on my ass and making mistakes and asking DPs, what can I do better? And asking the gaffer, how can I find my light? And asking the director, you know, what did I do wrong? And so that's been my education. Um, it probably took me 20 or 30 projects to really figure out what I was doing wrong and try to start to do it right. If I'd had the money, I would have gone to classes, but instead I just went to work. It seems like there's so many people that are very religious about going to their acting class once, twice a week, and, and then they go out to, for coffee afterward, and it's this big group sort of communal thing. Do you think a lot of that is a nice social outlet, but maybe it's not beneficial? Well, being on set is my social outlet. I'm a hermit otherwise, but I try to do about a movie a month, and um, that's my time to be social and you know hang around craft services and talk to people but also to learn about my craft to learn something from every single role so I guess that's doing the actual movies is my acting class which is a little bit dangerous because what if you're bad <laughs> and I have been but uh, yeah again it's just financial you know I never had the money to spend on the acting classes so I just decided well I'm just gonna start doing movies and learning as I go what about someone else who comes to LA and they don't have money for all of the gurus and the the workshops and all these different things that are constantly marketed to? Yeah, I don't. I don't have the money for those things. So what do they do? They go on YouTube. They Google videos. They work. Go to work. Go to work. It's what you're here for. Go to work. You can't tell me that in Los Angeles you can't find work. You cannot tell me that somewhere in this city right now there's not someone who will ask you to be a part of their project. It may not be paid, and if it pays, it may not be much, but if you're just starting out, that's what you do. Go to work. Don't moon about it, don't think about it, go to work. Get your ass on set, get in front of a camera, even if you think you're not ready, get in front of a camera, because that camera will teach you. It will be your teacher. And don't watch movies during the afternoon in your apartment. What's that? Don't watch movies during the afternoon in your apartment. Why watch a movie when you can be in a movie? Which do you learn more from? Be in the movie. How important is an actor's reel as a tool to help someone book work? Mm, your reel is huge, and your reel should be quick. And a trend that I've noticed even over the five years that I've been here is shorter clips. Uh, and clips that are well labeled. And not, not just one long reel, but short clips. Uh, Karen speaks French and blah, blah, blah. Um, Karen in rom-com, blah, blah, blah. You know, split those things up on YouTube. In addition to your physical reel, have lots of very short clips, a minute or less, that people can look at. Also have some longer scenes, but there's a, at least in my experience, there are a lot of people who don't want to sit through an entire scene. They don't want to take that journey with you because they're in the middle of their day. They just want to know what you look like on camera, so give them that opportunity in very short clips. And then of the sort of actor's tools, the reel, the resume, the IMDb page, the agent or the manager, if someone had to pick just one as the most crucial, which would it be? You can't pick just one. I mean, if, if it's your IMDb page, it has to be pimped out with your reel, because you want your reel on your, any, any actor who does not have a demo reel uploaded to IMDb, it's a part of the package. If you don't have your demo reel right there, you're crazy. That's, so I would say if you can't do anything else, have an IMDb page and a demo reel. But you know, that's not even, that's not even a false answer. Everything you've mentioned is going to be needed eventually. But if you have to have something to start with, get the IMDb page up, get the pictures up, and get your reel up. Of the tools available to an actor, the reel, the IMDb page, the resume, the agent or the manager, is there one that stands out as the best that you could really have without the rest or no? The Internet Movie Database page is the best tool that an actor has because it's the most visible one. So um, you gotta pimp that page out. I know actors and actresses who don't have pictures on their page, very bad. You know, load it up with pictures, and not just pictures you think are pretty, but pictures which show your brand. And I have some people who will do like, you know, I want to show my versatility, so every picture looks different. I'm not a fan of that. I think you should constantly reinforce what it is that you do. Um, also, on that page, 
you can put your demo reel up, and you should. You should you, I think you're allowed something like four or five demo reels. Put those clips up. And finally, a, a trick that I learned from Danny Trejo, from looking at his page, there's a section of IMDB which is called Trademarks. And that's where you can list things that the actor or actress is known for. And it's the same theory as the bio. What would you like to be known for? Say that you're known for it. And that if you do all of these things, then when people go to your IMDB page, they will see a complete picture of who you are as an actor, what you do, what your brand is, and it makes it very, very easy to consider you to be hired because you're a complete commodity there. What if you have the IMDB page, the reel, the resume, but not the actor and manager? Is that only good for a certain level and then after a point you can't really progress without the actor and manager? Yes, it's true. You do need management, uh, be it a manager or an agent. In, in my case, I have both, but for years I just had the manager. It's been tremendously helpful to me. I think you need that. You need the outside eye of someone who looks at the overall spear of your career. Um, are you going to pay them? Yeah, you're going to pay them. I mean, it's 15% of your income. You know, your, your agent, 10, 15% of your income. But that's money that you wouldn't have had. And I know actors who said, oh, you know, I don't want to get a manager because I don't want to pay the commission. But then you don't get the roles that would bring you the money to pay the commission anyway. So, yes. It, but again, that Internet Movie Database is very, very important because if you are approaching someone to be your representation, that's the first thing they're going to look at. Do you know how to market yourself? Do you have a clear idea of who you are as an actor? And it makes their job a lot easier if you do. On the flip side, what about the actor that gets that agent or manager and then sits by the phone or watches Nicholson movies during the day? If you're sitting by the phone waiting for your agent to call, you should go home, wherever home is because you're not going to make it. I hear this all the time. My agent does nothing for me. My manager does nothing for me. I get 98% of my work on my own, and then the deals are negotiated through my representation. I will send them leads. Here's someone who's interested in working with me, and then I don't hear anything for about a week, and then I get a call back saying, we've done the deal, here it is. What do you think? My job is to develop the leads, and that's my work. I never, ever, ever look to my agent or my manager to bring me work. That's not their job. Not their job. I don't wait for the phone to ring. If it does, that's just gravy, but I'm always working myself. Again, if, if that's the mindset, please don't come to L.A. because there's too many starving people here. So, again, going, I always use real estate as a, as a, it's like you're a realtor. You're hanging your license with the broker. Yes. Great. You've got that locked in now you're looking on the MLS for homes. Excellent analogy. That's exactly what it means. It just means that when, you're, when you are trying to promote yourself as the realtor, you can say, I'm associated with ABC agency. And it just gives you a little added stature, but you still have to do the work yourself. This is work that actors don't like to do because we just want to act. You know, all I'm the same way. I just want to act. But that's the, such a small tip of the iceberg, such a small part of my job.